I'd like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for homebodies who share my love for knitting, reading, and playing board games. If you are a new viewer, I'm really glad that you found your way to my little corner of the internet. And if you are a returning viewer, it is so wonderful to see you again. I'm glad that you're here. For those who uh, didn't realize, last weekend, well, almost two weekends ago at this point, I recorded a live video all about the last two sweaters that I knit myself, and that is now uploaded on the channel. So if you are interested and you weren't able to tune in live, then feel free to go check that out. But this is going to be a regular episode, so I'll talk a little bit about what I'm knitting on, and then a little bit about what I've been reading, and finally the board games. So what am I knitting? I am working on another sweater for myself. This winter, I had really planned to knit a lot of sweaters. And what actually happened was I ended up knitting sweater sleeves and sweater bags and no sweater fronts. And that was because uh, I went through a bit of a knitting slump. I didn't have a lot of brain power or energy to devote to knitting. But I had envisioned these sweaters with decorative fronts. And so instead, I just knit plain sleeves, plain bags, and then uh, didn't cast on for the fronts for a long time. So I'm really happy that this sweater is almost done and I will have cleared out my kind of backlog of works in progress. Almost. I still have Joel's sweater, but that's okay because I had no plans to finish that before the fall. So once I get to the end of the row, I'll show you, but this is knit out of Quince & Company Finch, which is a 100% wool fingering weight and it's US wool. Quince and Company is one of my very favorite yarn companies and it's interesting. The other two sweaters I knit were in superwash which is quite unusual for my knitting style and I hadn't realized how much I missed unprocessed wool knitting with it until I picked this sweater back up and a cowl that I might show you later. Um, and it kind of that and some reading and thinking that I've been doing has renewed my commitment to only knitting garments for myself out of non-superwash yarns. Um, so the rest of my sweater quantities and stash are non-superwash anyway. And I will just figure out ways to make that work with my lifestyle. Maybe knit more vests or something. But so this is the cardigan. I knit it in pieces and I have both the sleeves knit, but I decided not to seam them in yet because this neckband is definitely the most ambitious neckband that I have ever attempted to knit. And so I thought in case I need to work it a few times, it would be easier to do that without the extra weight of the sleeves. Thistle is trying to get to the other side of the couch. But here's a cameo. And this is my little old lady puppy, Thistle. My one-year-old puppy is downstairs napping. Whenever I talk about nap time, it's my puppy Nessie. It is not a baby, <laughs> if anyone was confused. Um, but we're in our first heat wave, and Thistle has water, but <laughs> with no fans on right now to record, it's definitely quite warm in here. Um, yeah, no more knitting. Just belly rubs. Just belly rubs. Okay. You can scooch now if you want. My couch is a sectional, so this likes to try out both ends for now. Okay, so as I was saying, it's going to be a three-quarter length sleeve cardigan, and it has a pico hem that's folded over, and the contrast yarn is also Quince & Company. It's Turn, which is their wool silk blend fingering weight. And then, of course, it's got this color work on it. And it's still a little bit lumpy, but I'm trying really hard not to criticize my knitting. <laughs> anyway, um, so this moth is from the um, Underwing Mitts, which I knit a few years ago for Jacqueline Salem's Underappreciated, like, underpopulated knit along. I can't remember if there had to be fewer than 15 projects or something. And then Jacqueline saw my pair and knit her pair and she started a whole trend. So now I'm sure everyone is very familiar with the pattern, which I'm very happy about. And so I, what I did was I just took the 
this part, obviously, of the moth chart. And I knit this part stranded, but then the edges are intarsied. And I did that because I, I just wanted the moth. I didn't want it to be an all-over colorwork sweater. Um, so here's what it looks like on the back. I haven't woven these end in, ends in yet because I am probably going to go tighten up my intarsia a little bit. I have barely knit any intarsia, and so I'm still kind of working on tensioning and all that. I don't think it looks quite as lumpy in person. but So also the underwings mitt is uh, inspired by a particular kind of moth that has bright color on their underwings, and so I might go in and duplicate stitch another color in there. I didn't worry about it for the chart. And the mitts also include a really beautiful moon pattern. So I did the moons above the sleeve cuffs, and then I also wanted them around the neck, which is what I was working on last night. I don't... <laughs> uh, there we go. There's some moons. Now, usually a colorwork sweater, if it has colorwork around the neck, it's one where it's knit in the round and you join the sleeves to the body and then you can just incorporate the color work into the neck as you're knitting it. But I really prefer structured sweaters. And especially I wanted this cardigan to look quite dressy. Oh, I don't think I mentioned the colors. The main color is Damson, which is a really beautiful purple. And then the contrast color is Driftwood which I just had in my stash. Um, as I was saying, I wanted it to feel a little dressy, and I just really like how seamed set in sleeve sweaters fit me. I like how they wear. And so I decided that I was going to try to just do the color work in the neckband because the moons are not that tall. They're about the size of what a neckband would be. And then... Just to make life more complicated, I also really wanted the Pico edge on the neckband as well, which means that I need to do a facing like this. And that the, the thing that makes it complicated is that when you're knitting a neckband, you're knitting circular knitting, and the same way that like in a car racetrack, the inner corner is shorter than the outer corner with the neckband this part is shorter. And so what I did was I worked some decreases in the chart. I found some logical places to put those in. Then I knit more decreases in the plain part of the knitting. And I also switched up my needle sizes. So I think I, I started with a US three, which is what I used to knit the body. And I went down to a two and a half and then a two. So now with the facing, I am going to reverse that, but at least it's just plain knitting instead of doing Fair Isle, or sorry, stranded color work as well. But so I don't know for sure that um, the decreasing and needle downsizing is going to be enough to make it so that it sits flat. I figure I will go ahead and once it's um, once the hem is folded over, I should have a better sense of that. But before I started doing the folded over hem, it looked like it was going to sit pretty nicely. But yeah, so once I sort that out, I'll just do the button bands. I'm going to do them folded, so probably still stuck in it, but I'm not going to add the pico edge because I think that that would look a little off. So what I might do is... Um, do like a little stripe of the contrast on the beginning and end of each and then I'll probably just do a purl row for the fold and yeah I'm really thrilled with this I can't wait to get to wear it in the fall of course uh, there's more of that beautiful moon pattern I don't know if you guys can see it there's a there we go yeah. The lighting in here is beautiful lighting, but it is not kind to my knitting. <laughs> um, so I knit this at, I think, around six stitches to the inch, which is usually more of a sport weight gauge, but I like 
the fabric that that creates in Finch, which is a pretty plump fingering weight. And the other cardigan that I have in this yarn has worn really well being at that gauge. So I don't think that I need to go tighter in order to wear, you know, I'm not that worried about wear. I do have cat fur all over it because of mob. Um, yeah, so that is what I was planning to work on. But now that I remembered that constantly talking while knitting does make it a bit trickier to remember increases and that kind of thing. So I think I'll go ahead and set that aside and work on my other project instead, which is quite simple. And it means I get to talk to you about one more project. Let me just take a sip of tea first. I hope that the ice didn't clink too loudly. So first of all, my niece uh, knit, knit, made me this yarn bowl for Christmas, and I love it so much. There's the yarn side. She painted it in a ceramic studio with snow. Or not this Christmas, that's Christmas. She loves me. So that is where that came from. And this is the other project that I've been working on. And I have just needed, I just ran out of the first ball of yarn, so I need to go ahead and join in the new one, which this is a 100% alpaca yarn. I've never actually tried to felt splice alpaca. I don't know if you can or not, but I just decided not to worry about it. So... <laughs> Um, this is how I join the yarn if I know that I'm not going to be felt splicing it, and then I just weave in the ends later. So this yarn is actually a farm yarn. My local friends, Christy and Kristen, are both also into fiber arts and knitting and all those good things. And we went to the Finger Lakes Fiber Festival a couple of years ago now together, which was great. And last year, they both went, but I was not able to because Nessie the puppy was very young and I had no energy <laughs> for anything other than puppying. So Kristen bought this beautiful yarn from one of the vendors there. They're an alpaca farmer um, somewhere around Albany, she was saying. And she knit herself a star shower cowl out of it, which looks beautiful. And she wasn't sure what to do with the leftovers, so she gave them to me which I was pretty thrilled about. And when I weighed them, I had 189 grams, which is quite a lot of fingering weight yarn, especially I knew I wanted to knit a cowl. So before that, I'd been planning on doing a star shower cowl as well, but that only requires 100 grams of yarn. So I thought that maybe I could make a double cowl, uh, a double looped one. And I looked at a few patterns on Ravelry, but I wasn't nothing felt quite right so then I pulled out my stitch dictionaries and I swatched several lace stitches I was thinking I wanted a stockinette based lace stitch because Danish forest is one of my favorite cowls to wear and that's what that has I actually swatched with this yarn in Danish forest pattern too and I liked them but I wasn't in love with any of them and then I tried out some seed stitch just to see because it's one of my favorite stitches. I think the texture is wonderful, and I have a cowl that I knit out of seed stitch that I also wear a lot. And that completely won me over. I thought that it just, it's what the yarn wanted to be, at least for me. And it also felt like a nice thing for me to be knitting. I'm kind of in a between projects mode. Obviously, I'm just finishing up that cardigan, the purple one. And I'm trying to decide what I want to cast on next as far as a big project and I had just finished some socks so I didn't have any kind of simple pick up and go knitting and or reading knitting so all of those reasons are why I decided to just go ahead and do another seed stitch cowl so I did a provisional cast on down here at the bottom and I will have to look up how to graft in seed stitch uh, when when the time comes because I don't remember I, I know that I did it before but it was such a long time ago and I've just been knitting I cast on enough stitches that it's around 12 inches wide or 30 centimeters and I'll probably knit to around <coughs> 60 inches which 
is 150 centimeters and just a little bit shorter than my height. And I have found that that's the length I really like for double wrapped cowls. But I'm, I think I'm a little over halfway there. Yeah. And so here's what it will look like being worn. And I love it because it looks a little bit like something out of season one of Outlander, which I absolutely love the costume choices in that season. I do not go into television shows expecting them to be um, historically accurate. So it didn't bother me that there wouldn't have been that kind of knitwear <laughs> in the 18th century because I thought it was just so beautiful. So I'm really thrilled with how this is turning out. It's a really beautiful natural dark brown that's kind of silvery, which I hadn't realized how much I loved cool browns until I started knitting because it's not a color that I see a lot in clothing in general, but it is very common in undyed yarn because apparently a lot of animals like to be that. And it just feels so wonderful to be knitting with a fiber that I know where it came from. I know that it was local, fairly local, and I, it's fairly unprocessed. It makes me really happy. And that, I used to really prioritize that when choosing yarns to knit with, and I think that I need to get back into prioritizing that, just since it seems to make projects even more enjoyable for me. And uh, I don't knit as much these days, which is okay. I, I'm very happy with the amount of knitting that I do. And um, one of the upsides of that is that it means that since I don't knit as often, I don't need as much yarn. And so that means that if the more local or unprocessed or environmentally friendly yarn um, costs extra money, that's okay because my yarn budget is my yarn budget. So if it doesn't need to last me as long, does that make sense? If it doesn't need to provide me as many hours of knitting, <laughs> then it's okay for the yarn to cost a little bit more. I've mentioned a lot in the past about various things that I do to uh, find yarn that I like that's ethically made and nice quality for less than retail price. Mainly I do Ravelry D-Stash. Um, so I am still very much in favor of that kind of thing as well. But Yeah, and I don't know if there will be any fiber festivals this year because of the pandemic, <laughs> but I hope that one year there are festivals again and I'm really looking forward to going with Christy and Kristen. We actually have also talked about doing a Rhinebeck trip because Kristen's family lives not too far away from there. So we shall see, perhaps one fall. I should also mention that my stitch marker is by Maria of Woolen Forest, Forest Charm on Etsy. And it's a really beautiful little pumpkin. And I've been using it as a progress keeper just every day when I sit down to work on this for the first time. I pop the pumpkin up and then I see how much I've knit. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think that is all of the knitting that I would like to talk about. Although in an upcoming episode, I think I'm going to show you some yarn and ask you to help me decide what sweater to knit. If you hear noise is going on that's moth trying to figure out how to open the sitting room door and there's another thistle canyon but let us transition into the book section of the podcast <clears throat> my throat's not used to podcasting again yet so i'm currently in the middle of a few books which are all really incredible <laughs> So the first of those is called A Hope Divided by Alyssa Cole. It's the second in her series, The Loyal League. And it's historical romance set during the U.S. Civil War with African-American main characters. And um, it's blowing me away. It's so incredibly good. 
She has become one of my favorite authors because of a contemporary romance series that she wrote called the Reluctant Royal series. I am not at all interested in royalty, so the name of that series and like the theme did not appeal to me, but I decided to give it a chance because the covers are wonderful. And I love the way she draws characters, I love her stories and her settings, and so I would highly recommend that series. I There's three novels and two novellas. And she quickly became like a comfort read author for me. And I knew that I wanted to read this series as well. Um, I put it off for a little bit because I was having a rough time in the winter and I wasn't sure if... I. One of the nice things about reading romances is you know that you're guaranteed a happy ending, which I think can make it safer as a reader to go to dark places in a book. I think I've mentioned this before. To me, it's one of the real powers of romance novels. Anyway, uh, so I knew that there would be a happy ending, but I just wasn't sure how comforting it would be. And I would not call these comforting books, but they are safe books. And within the safety, Alyssa Cole is exploring themes and ways that power manifests that are still incredibly relevant to 21st century America. Um, obviously, I'm recording this during a week where there have been more news stories, but I feel like that could pretty much be any week this year. And I'm, I don't want to go into the details because um, I, I don't want to cause any more trauma or anxiety for any of my black viewers, basically. <laughs> um, but I think that this series, so far, the first two at least, has done um, a really incredible job, Alyssa Cole has, with how she's portraying the race relations and the gender dynamics and the power. And in both of the books, there's been white women who very much weaponize their whiteness and use it to cause immense harm. And that's something that still goes on. And it's something that we as white women aren't always aware of. It's very easy within the rhetoric of contemporary feminism to see ourselves as oppressed because we're women and not necessarily see that we are also oppressors because we are white. And in particular, being portrayed as vulnerable and being hurt can is a way that white women can weaponize white men, basically, and encourage them to act violently towards people of color. Which we saw this week when um, a white woman called the cops because a black man told her that her dog needed to be on leash, according to the law. And it it's very clear that she was calling the cops in an attempt to use them as a weapon against this man. And so obviously I'm speaking to the white women <laughs> in my audience right now. I think that we need to be very mindful of how we discuss our feelings and how even if we don't actively intend to weaponize things the way that the characters in these books and the woman in Central Park did. Even a carelessly phrased sentence can end up being a weapon because that's the world that we live in. And I, I think Alyssa Cole did an incredible job portraying that power. So, um, so these books are not always comfortable reads for me, but I think that they are really important reads. And even though there is very much a focus on the political dynamics and the power dynamics and um, 
the abhorrence of slavery in these books. The, the thing that makes me really love them is that is the characters. That's really what makes me love any book. And Alyssa Cole is wonderful at creating characters. And um, in particular, so I feel like sometimes in historical fiction, and it's usually by white authors, there's, a, or even just history nonfiction, there's a tendency to portray enslaved people as just kind of helpless victims. I don't know if I was trying to say hapless or helpless there. Or as if they had no agency in their lives. Or as if like the ones that ran away are the ones that are somehow the superheroes. I don't know. There's, there's just a lot of problematic ways to depict enslaved people. And uh, Alyssa Cole does an incredible job of showing all the different ways that enslaved people retained their humanity. And there's just so much nuance in these books. I think that they're really wonderful reads. And I think that they will bring anyone who reads them both a lot of pleasure and a lot of food for thought. And I think especially as white women who need to be incredibly cognizant of what's going on at the moment in order to prevent more harm, um, I would even more thoroughly recommend these books. I hope that that makes sense. I, I didn't plan any of these thoughts. <laughs> So if I sound a little incoherent or hesitating, that's why. But I do also want to emphasize that I love Alyssa Cole because she is an incredibly gifted author who brings worlds and characters to life. And I'm so glad that I get to spend time inside her books. I'm not reading them as some kind of political statement. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just re starting this series over the last week with has just been very, uh, it, it feels very appropriate. So that is my daytime fiction reading and I cannot wait to read the third book as well, but I kind of don't want them to end. But that's okay, I can always reread them. So my audiobook currently is called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer and this is a reread for me actually. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a botanist and she is a professor actually near me. Uh, she's over in Syracuse. <laughs> That's Moth finally realizing that she can just push the door open so I'm sure you'll see the cat soon. Anyway and she's also a member of the Potawatomi Nation. And her, she's written two nonfiction books. The first one is Gathering Moss, and then this one, Braiding Sweetgrass. And she is a beautiful essayist. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Here's Moth. And what I love about her essays is the way that they combine her cultural background with science with a wonderful brand of kind of love and hopefulness. She, I suppose that this is something that she shares in common with Alyssa Cole, just in the sense that neither of them try to find hope by pretending things are other than what they are. And they don't shy away from looking at all of um, the challenges going on, in this case, in the natural world mainly in the U.S. Yeah, I think all her essays so far are about the U.S. But somehow she manages to write about these devastating problems in a way that both moves you but also leaves you feeling hopeful at the end of it. And one of the themes of this essay collection is that humans are not separate from nature. We are part of nature and the Western dichotomy of 
people and nature is not true. And the way that this dichotomy plays out is sometimes in the idea that any way that humans interact with um, wild places must be harmful. And Robin Wall Kimmerer shows that that is not true, that for so many indigenous people, their uh, traditional ways of interacting with the wilderness benefits everyone. And I just think that that is such an incredibly powerful and moving message. And she, as I said, she's also just a wonderful writer. And so she's really good at bringing to life the natural scenes that she encounters. And I love kind of living vicariously through her because with my chronic illnesses and Joel has a lot of allergies, uh, camping or living, we might be able to manage a little bit of camping if there was electricity at the campsite uh, for my heating pads. But any kind of like deep camping, hiking, or ever living in the countryside are just not in the cards for us. And so uh, being able to read books by naturalists is really meaningful to me. And I've actually been very much in the mood for popular biology kind of reads, I think because spring is sprung here. <laughs> but Robin Wall Kimmerer is one of my very favorites. Um, I consider reading her essays a spiritual practice as well as just a pleasure. And if you haven't read her yet, you definitely should. Finally, so that's my audiobook, and I was so thrilled to realize that my library had the audiobook because it's narrated by her, which is wonderful because I've read and reread her books, but I didn't realize what she sounded like, and now I do. <laughs> and it makes the essays, many of which include like personal stories from her life, that much more intimate and moving, I think. I'm sorry, I know that I'm looking at my cow a lot. I don't know why. It's seed stitch. Perhaps it's just alpaca is a little bit floppier than yarn than wool yarn <clears throat> I'm sure you can hear moth purring she's got a very loud purr she does not mind that it's a heat wave um, yeah so those are two of the books I'm reading and those are the two that I am really in love with and would highly recommend I am also reading The Hidden World of the Fox by Adele Brand as an ebook. Um, I said that I was really in the mood for science type nonfiction books, and so this is one of the ones that I got from the library. It's interesting. Uh, she's a British author, and so while she does mention a bit about North American foxes, the focus is more on British foxes. I do like that she's looking at foxes in kind of a contemporary urban environment um and so i'm learning a lot of information but i don't find the book particularly moving or soul touching which is okay <laughs> not every book needs to be like that i think it's just in comparison to braiding sweet grass and then the loyal league series you know and then i think because i'm reading it concurrently with robin wall kimmerer i noticed the ways that kind of Western biases are creeping into the text and there's some things that I'm like, mm, maybe not. But it's very much, I think it's a, it's a good book. If you're at all interested in foxes, I'm sure that you will enjoy it. There, it, I am really enjoying, I'm using that word a lot. <laughs> anyway, I am really enjoying it as well. And I don't think it's a book that I would reread or anything, but it's definitely one that's satisfying my need to learn more. I Last year, or last summer, I should say, there was a fox that lived on one of my main walking paths. And it was really fun to be able to see it frequently. Um, Thistle, when she realized that there was a fox there, she refused to walk on that path for a while, which I thought was interesting. Because <laughs> usually she's pretty chill about outdoor things. But... Um, yeah, so these are just the kind of nonfiction books that I probably enjoy most, either social history or popular science. And let me know if you have any favorite popular science books that you would recommend that I check out. And that's also my bedtime book, the Fox one, just because 
um, there's nothing that's going to upset me. <laughs> so it's my late evening book. Let's see. Obviously, because I took a while in between recording, there are a few other books that I read, but I feel like talking about those three was enough for one episode. And I'm sure that any other authors that I read in the last couple of weeks, I'll read again at some point. I've become very much um, focused on reading and rereading authors I love. Every once in a while, I'll go on a kick and try a bunch of new ones, because otherwise I would never find any new favorites. But whenever I'm not sure what to read next, I just tend to fall back on trustworthy authors. Like I said, feel free to share your favorite science books or social history books with me. And so now I think it's time to move on to board games and for me to take another sip of water. By water, I mean iced tea. Sorry, the heat is getting to me. <laughs> also, I'm growing out my bangs. <laughs> And they're at that really fun stage where if I wear them full, it's a lot of hair. But they're not quite long enough to want to be true side bangs yet. So, just in the awkward middle point, which I'm sure anyone who's ever tried to grow out bangs or a pixie cut, which I've also done, is very familiar with. Um, it'll pass. <laughs> so Joel and I took a little bit of a break from board games. We were both going through a kind of stressful week. Uh, Nessie the puppy got spayed, and that's a very good thing, but in order to make sure that she recovered quickly and well, she really needed to be on a lot of crate rest. And when she wasn't in the crate, like when she was snuggling with us on the couch or bed, she needed to be leashed and tethered and paid a lot of attention to because um, any kind of jumping can reopen the incision, which would not be good. And Nessie loves to jump. Jumping is a way of life with her. And she couldn't even go for walks. So she actually handled it really beautifully. I thought she was going to be a lot more upset than she was. I was really worried because she loves her walks. She loves, you know, running around. She loves getting to play tug. And I worried that taking away all the things that let her exercise her energy would not end well. But she, she was so sweet about it. And now her incision is healed and she's back to her normal lifestyle with, and we're back to ours. But um, that my anxiety kind of about that was messing with my sleep. So I was sleep deprived, which always just exacerbates my illnesses. And then Joel was having stress at work. And so when we talked about playing board games a couple weekends ago, I was like, let's just not because... As fun as board games are, they create artificial stress. That's what makes them fun, right? Either you're competing against each other, so there's the stress of finding out who's done a better job and scored more points, or if it's direct competition, like the kind where you are messing with the other person, that's very stressful. And then cooperative games are still stressful because you're competing against the game, and the game might win. <laughs> and uh, some of the cooperatives can be quite difficult. I don't find cooperatives too stressful, but Joel certainly does. And I just didn't feel like we needed to invite more of that into our lives. So instead, we took walks and we did a little bit of gardening, which was wonderful. And things that, you know, are more ways to interrupt the stress cycle than ways to create <laughs> new stress cycles. But luckily now we're both feeling better, and so we did play some board games over the long weekend, which was it was really fun getting back to them. So we played Quirky Circuits again, which is a cooperative game that I've talked about before, and we it was great. <laughs> uh, this, I think I've mentioned, but this game has 24 different scenarios, as they call it, which are basically different boards that you're playing on with one of four robots, your programming robots, that's the point of the game. And then they all have slightly different rules and slightly different goals, and they increase in difficulty. So we had played the first two and managed to win each of them right away, and so then we started the third, and we did not win the first time. <laughs> we almost squeaked out a victory, but we did not. 
And so we decided to just go ahead and play again right away. And the second time went a lot more smoothly. And it was just, it's really fun. What I enjoy about it is that if you play with the same person, you start to learn kind of what their style is and what they're probably telling the robot to do. But then it's just so funny if you guess wrong and then the robot is just like going on a rampage. <laughs> Uh, so I very much enjoy that one. I find it very lighthearted and fun. And also it's really cute. The artwork is really fun and cute. I'm using that word a lot. But that's what board games should be, right? It's probably, uh, we got quite a few new cooperative games in April because that's our birth month. And we were both in the mood for more co-ops. And I that's my favorite of the bunch. It feels different than the other cooperative games I've played too. And then we played a couple of competitive games. We played Above and Below, which also has really cute artwork. And in that one, each of you are creating a village. And what I really like is that the artwork for the villagers is quite diverse. And in addition to creating your village above ground and recruiting villagers and doing buildings and harvesting crops, you can also go exploring in the caves below ground. And the game comes with an encounter book, which are basically these single paragraph, choose your own adventure type scenarios. And so whoever's going exploring, the other player gets to read the scenario and then the explorer chooses and you do have to roll some dice. You don't just automatically get what you choose. But I really enjoy that. It is a nice way of interacting, adding interaction to a competitive game that the interaction is not competitive. And Joel and I tend to do different voices and stuff when we're reading out loud because we also like to play Dungeons and & Dragons. <laughs> and so the more voices you can do, the better for those kinds of games. Uh, and yeah, and it provides like a kind of whimsical element to the game, which is just appealing. I will say that when, so I think this was our fifth or sixth play, uh, the first few plays, I took the exploring very seriously. I would go exploring with certain end goals in mind, and then most of the time those end goals would not be met because it's quite a random element. And then I would get so frustrated <laughs> and have a bit of a sulk, and it was not the best. So this game on Monday, I my only goal for playing the game was to not sulk. And so rather than create my whole strategy around exploring. I created it around other things and then went exploring just for fun and that worked out really well. Um, I stayed chipper the whole time. I should say that even in the games where I was sulking, I usually won, but like I was just annoyed <laughs> that I hadn't gotten the exact thing that I wanted in this very random part of the game. It was a silly thing to be annoyed about. I just bring it up because um, if you're thinking about getting it and your you or someone you regularly game with has that kind of tendency then it's just something that you should know about um board gaming has definitely made me come face to face with a lot of my personality flaws and try to work on them more which is good right i'll, I'll grow eventually uh, so the publisher red raven games they it's um, I think the same designer who also does the artwork and he self-publishes his games. And so they've put out several games with that kind of storytelling aspect to it. So um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, then you can look into their other games. They're releasing a new one later this year that's cooperative, and I'm very, very interested in that. And then finally, we played Roll for the Galaxy which is a game I got for Christmas a couple of years ago. And as the name suggests, it comes with a lot of dice uh, in various colors and they're about that big and you end up getting to roll a whole lot of them at once in very noisy dice cups and then drop it on the table and sort them all out. So it's a very appealing game uh, from a tactile perspective. And like you're arranging all your dice behind the screen and then you're trying to guess how your opponents are arranging their dice because that can benefit you. 
Uh, and since everyone's doing that at the same time, there's a really nice flow to the game, in my opinion. Like, there's not a lot of downtime where you're just sitting waiting for another player to do something. Uh, so it's it's one of my favorite games. It's definitely one of those competitive games where there isn't a lot. There There's not any kind of sabotage type of actions that you do to other players. You're mainly each building your own galaxy tableau. But there is interaction in that um, each of you gets to activate one of... I think five or six actions with your dice and then whichever one you've activated everyone else can do as well so that's why you're trying to guess what everyone is choosing behind their dice or behind their screens so there you're certainly encouraged to pay attention to what other players are doing and what kind of strategies they're using and how you can kind of piggyback on that so I like that there is interaction but not competitive not direct interaction if that makes sense and it's definitely a game that rewards multiple plays. There's a lot of different symbols. And the rule book makes things seem very complex. But once you've actually played a round or two, it's, it's fairly accessible. And the player screens actually have all of that information right on the back, which is really nice. We played this with one of our neighbors after Joel and I had played it enough that we knew it. But he had never played it before. And it only took him a couple rounds to catch on. So it seems like there's a high barrier to entry. Um, but once you've played a game or two, I think the, the gameplay is actually quite simple and straightforward, which I like. There's a lot of possibility for different strategies and nuance and fun, but it still is going to play in like 30 to 40 minutes. And the actual mechanics of what you're doing in each round are very straightforward. So that's one of my favorite combinations for a board game and probably part of why I like it so much. I also play that one solo. There's not a solo variant included in the game uh, rulebook, but over on Board Game Geek, which is like the Ravelry for board gamers, if you're a knitter, um, people will post solo variants that they've come up with. And because this game um, doesn't have a lot of direct competition, there's a pretty simple solo variant that I very much enjoy playing. So I always like that. Um, I've been playing more and more board games solo. It, it has definitely, at first I thought I was only playing board games for the interaction, but I also just like the different puzzles that they present. And so sometimes if I'm in the mood for that kind of puzzle, but Joel, is my only board game partner at the moment because of the pandemic. Uh, when, but Joel is too tired, then solo games are great. Or if I just, um, I have found that they're really handy if I'm kind of getting a little anxious or stressed about something. And knitting is very soothing, but it lets me keep thinking about other things while I knit. Whereas if I pick a, a board game then it makes me kind of dive into the little details of that game, and so I forget whatever I'm stressed about for a while. So I have found it to be very helpful <laughs> as far as lowering anxiety levels goes. And I'm sure that I will talk about more solo games in the future. Let me know if anyone is interested in that um, in particular. I assume that most people interested in board games play them with other people, but if there are any other solo gamers watching, let me know. And that is pretty much what I have been up to lately uh, as far as my homebody hobbies. Thank you so much for joining me and keeping me company while I have been knitting. I hope that whatever craft project you were working on has been going smoothly. <laughs> And thank you so much to everyone who leaves comments. I really love having a little community here and getting to know you and just, it's brought a lot of pleasure to my life. I really missed you and I wasn't able to podcast and now that I'm back in the habit, I definitely want to, like I make sure that I've saved spoons so that I can do this because it brings me a lot of joy. And speaking of community, 
I ha would like everyone to join with me in wishing Sue a happy birthday. Let me just, yeah. So happy birthday to Sue out in California. Her husband contacted me and let me know that her birthday is coming up on June 4th and that a shout out from me would be appreciated. So congratulations, Sue. Uh, I love birthdays. <laughs> I think it's just wonderful <laughs> to celebrate um, your existence, really. <laughs> So congrats on this milestone birthday, and I hope that you have an absolutely splendid day. And anyone who wants to leave a comment wishing Sue happy birthday, feel free to do that down below here on YouTube. And yeah, so thanks to Lee, Sue's husband, for reaching out to me and asking if I could do that. Once again, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. I know that it's not until next week, so depending on when you're watching the podcast, but... That is everything, so I will bring Martha to help me say goodbye, and I will see you again next week. In the meantime, feel free to leave questions down on YouTube. It's probably the easiest for me, and I will answer them either typing or while recording my next episode. I am on Instagram, but I haven't really posted much there, so... <laughs> But if you would like to follow, I do post pictures of the pets and my walks, basically, in my uh, stories. So I'm the charm of it there as well. And thank you so much for tuning in and subscribing and viewing. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Are you the sweetest kitty?